Malaysian businesses can no longer afford to rest on their laurels, content to be jago kampung, big fish in a small pond. Malaysia's location on the global map puts us in the middle of an ASEAN economic community, and all of us, bar none, find ourselves in 2013 at a crossroads. In one direction, a treasure trove of, of opportunity, the other, economic wilderness. Which will it be? The Global Malaysia series, brought to you by the Economic Transformation Programme and BFM, seeks to bring out the best in Malaysian businesses and urges us to forge onwards and outwards into the region and beyond. Will we be conquerors of an ASEAN market comprising 600 million people with a combined GDP of $1.8 trillion, indeed even the global markets, or will we fall victims to our fears and insecurities? In this inaugural issue of the Global Malaysia series, we have the great pleasure of welcoming Tan Sri Lee Oi Hien, the Chief Executive of Kuala Lumpur Kapong Bahad. Ladies and gentlemen, KL Kapong with a market cap of approximately $7.3 billion started out as a plantation company more than a century ago. Today, through a series of acquisitions, its plantation land bank now stands at more than a quarter of a million hectares spread across Malaysia and Indonesia. It has also diversified globally, not just into oleo chemicals, but also successfully vertically integrating both its upstream and downstream businesses. Through a series of joint ventures and acquisitions in Malaysia, Indonesia, China, and Europe, KL Kupong is today truly a global player in the multi-billion dollar palm and edible oils industry. We hope that Tan Sri's presence here today will allow all of us in this room to tap his deep pools of wisdom and decades of experience, not just as a planter and entrepreneur, but also as a son and a father, to emerge wiser, braver, and more inspired to conquer this brave new world we find ourselves in today. Tan Sri, thank you for being with us today. Your leadership style has evolved through the years. Do share with us how it has changed through these past few years. First of all, uh, thank you very much, Juan, uh, for inviting me here for this first inaugural series. I'm very honored. Regarding leadership style, I think the first thing we got to remember is that we are all human beings, you know. So I think it's very important that we treat each other with due respect and fairness. I think that's the, that's the first ingredient of, uh, of being a good leader. I think in the world today, many of us worship celebrity leaders, you know. Sometimes we hear leaders being very dominant, uh, dominating. Some leaders who have absolutely no feelings for their employees. They only care about their golden parachute if something goes wrong or take the company on a very dangerous route. I think that is not the type of leadership that we would like to see, but we would like to see a more consistent leadership that over time brings out the value and the, and the culture that we want to inculcate in a company. The culture of openness, fairness, I think, uh, minimize the back biting of uh, colleagues, of uh, working together. And of course, as usual, uh, there will always be the need for conflict resolutions. You know, for us to, to, as a leader, you have always to be aware of the conflicts going on within the company and how do you smooth out those conflicts between the employees. But basically, it's the employees that is doing the work for you. But on top of that, I think one has got to have a very good uh, macro view of the industry that you are in, you got to, the, the leaders got to know a fair amount of details because otherwise it's very hard for you to brainstorm with the employees on the direction, on the issues, on the, on the other thing, and gradually to gain their respect over the time, over time. Because leadership, genuine leadership, as they say, respect must be earned and not inherited. Yeah. And yet in the early days, Tantri, and you've you know, told us this offline uh, previously, uh, when you were first into the mantle as, as CEO, and today, many decades later, your leadership style has evolved from perhaps being a little bit more uh, aggressive in the early days, perhaps to perhaps a more tempered approach today. Is that necessarily true? 
Yeah, I think as we grow older, we tend to mellow more. And uh, I think it's very true that when we were young, we were very impatient. We couldn't see the, uh, we couldn't see, uh, we always think that we are always better than the other person because we are more gung-ho, we think we are more wiser. But I think with time, it's the reverse, you know. You tend to spend more time to listen to people. I think that you, at, point I think at some point in the past, don't you, you were asked um, what kept you awake at night. What, of all the dozens and hundreds of things that are sifting through your mind at night before you go to sleep, what keeps you most awake at night? I think sometimes, of course, in life, there are a lot of problems. Problems with uh, staff, losing some key staff, losing some uh, key business, thinking about some uh, uh, issues that can transform your business. I think those are the things that normally keep us awake at night. Yeah. But I must confess that I sleep quite well at night. <laughs> <laughs> in, in your saying, um, you know, in the past, Tan Sri, that uh, if you look back, and of course, looking back, you always look back with 2020 vision, but uh, you've said before that uh, if you if you did you know you would do things three to four hundred percent different uh, um, if you were to do things differently in the past. Uh, is there a lesson to be learned for the younger MDs and the younger CEOs in the room today in in terms of getting as much right as possible from the get go? Yeah. yeah, I think of course with hindsight, everybody can do better. That, that's true. But I think in the past. We, for KLK and myself, we certainly have been a little bit too conservative in acquisition. There are some acquisitions that, are, you, that you can afford to miss. You can afford to make mistakes. But there are some acquisitions that will transform your companies. And these are the transforming acquisitions that we should actually pay a lot of attention and to, even though we have to pay a premium for it, it will probably worth the, worth the, worth the effort because or the, worth paying the value because this is going to change your company. So I think this is one of the, the mistakes that we reflect on in, in the past. But in order to know this, one has got to have a very good macro view of the industry that you in, the different players and uh, uh, much more details about the direction in which you aim the business to grow into. Well, the year is now 2013, and um, clearly technology has evolved to a point where we've got a plethora of data in front of us. We have reams of information from which to make our decision. Should management, younger management especially, make, um, well, I guess take the bull by the horns and be a bit more aggressive now that we know, kind of know at least what's in store for us um, three, five years out from now? Yeah, uh, I think things have changed a lot because information is now so free. Technology is more easily accessible. And uh, I think, as you mentioned, the market is global. And uh, I don't think for Malaysian companies, we have to start thinking much more global and, seeing, and to see ASEAN as our market, you know. I think we tend to see, we tend to give higher value to the developed markets like the United States, the EU, and all those things. But I think also right in front of us, we have also a very big ASEAN market in which the culture is closer to us and, uh, and it's easier for us to expand to. So the first thing that we sh maybe we should be doing is to focus more on these markets. In term, and you touched on this before in terms of human capital, Tansri. When you go and visit other, other operations around the region, um, how do you galvanize your people? How do you encourage your people to think a little bit outside of the box and not be a bit paranoid about other operations, be they better run or less better run? And how do you impose this culture of innovation and open-mindedness among the people, among the staff? First, I think is that we... KLK is very fortunate to have a very group of very loyal staff that have been able to uh, that enable us to 
uh, partner with them to go overseas in new countries like Indonesia, where we certainly need our trustworthy men to be there while we are building up the local management and to inculcate, inculcating uh, our, our values into, that, into the uh, management overseas. But in terms of innovation, I think it's very important for us to be broad-minded. A lot of innovation is already out there. You have got to pick up the innovation, maybe adapt it a little bit. And that's why the mind frame that I always used to tell, talk with my people, that even you visit other people's operations, if there's one good idea you can, you can bring back, it's more than worth it. It's definitely more than worth it. And I think the worst thing to have is to live in an ostrich world where you think you are the best and nobody can teach you anymore. Well, Tan Sri, you said in the past that business life and is trying to, it's like trying to set new world records in a 100-meter race. It's, it's slow and incremental and very, very painful. Well, until uh, um, Usain Bolt came along, that was the case. Uh, but, you know, do flesh out you know, that, that idea for us. Yeah. I think for a long time, I'll just give you a... Uh, a case of the plantation industry. For a long time, we think that Malaysia is actually on top of the world. You know, we are the leaders in the plantations and uh, until we go to Indonesia. We find that their extraction rates are better than us, the oil extraction rates from the EFB. Some of the mills there are doing 25% uh, OER, oil extraction rates. In our industry here, we are very happy with 22%. This is a case in mind. So it's like the 100 meters. Now we know that they are doing 25%. So we have to challenge our people, why are you still here? You know, what is it that we need to do to bring up to those type of levels? It's uh, like running the 100 meters, you know. You know somebody has done, has broken the 10 seconds. The second person to break it is easier than the first one. So we have got to be aware of uh, what other people are doing and challenge ourselves to do much better. And I think this one of the strong points in our industry in Malaysia is that we are very friendly competitors. Although we might be competitors, we do share knowledge. We should have, uh, for example, KLK and Bows that have a joint research. So we do work together in many areas to improve ourselves. Staying on the subject of human capital, Tantri, um, we you have, as with most entrepreneurs in the room, outlined the importance of innovation. But innovation is a byproduct of an education system, is a byproduct of competition, and those two issues are arguably innovation in Malaysia. Now, how what is the scope of the challenge here for entrepreneurs and and the staff that they they head? I think for innovation, first of all, you must have got a good human capital. You must get the right person to, to be doing the innovation in your R&D team. You must have the right uh, group of uh, personnel in whatever areas that you are doing. And innovation is a consistent effort. You know? it's, not a, it's not something... It's, nowadays, it's quite hard for us to find... A, a, a solution to answer all our problems. So it's a step-by-step -step improvement most of the time. But cumulatively, you will bring uh, us uh, to be a much more competitive uh, position in the industry. What is important? I think human capital is very important. The, the education system of our country is extremely important. And I think this is where we in Malaysia has to work towards improving our education system, improving our, our um, uh, the command of the English language, whether we like it or not. This is to be a global world. There's no other way. There's no other way. And we mustn't be, we must not sit on our uh, laurel and say that we are doing very well. Okay. In order to do this, we must bring back some more elements of the 
kleptocracy in our system. Knowing fully well the importance of those, those topics, Don Sri, and having already gone abroad many, many years earlier, could your job have been a lot easier if we had a better foundation, arguably? Uh, I think Malaysia did have a very good foundation for the generation like myself, you know. We had a very good foundation. But uh, we do also have a problem of the newer graduates that are not as we used to think. We, we are thinking, our opinion is that they are not as competent as ourselves. Maybe we are a little bit biased, you know. But uh, you will help if, they are, if their command of the language is better, if, they are, if their standards set are much higher. But anyway, I think we are working as a group to actually to upgrade their skill sets before we bring them uh, overseas. I think the case is South Korea. South Korea is a country that has uh, grown by leap and bounds. I think all of us are using Samsung telephones, uh, television, they conquer everything in chemicals and all those things. They have a very good group of universities, you know, and they have a very good Korean culture, which binds all the people together to be loyal to their country, to build for the country. I think there's a lot of lessons to be drawn from the Korean experience. In fact, a lot of management experts have outlined the, Ger the Japanese culture, the, Ger the German culture, the South Korean culture, and they've gone and expanded overseas and bought more companies overseas. If within the Malaysian context, country, how, how can we take the bull by our own horns and, and ensure that we have a strong Malaysian culture going overseas as and when we want to go abroad, we want to go regional, we want to go international, but we need to go there with a strong core of Malaysians who count themselves Malaysians first and foremost. I, I think it's happening now. It's happening now. I think Malaysian co companies, especially the bigger companies like Sindabi and the GLCs and uh, some of the other uh, uh, larger capitalization companies are making acquisition overseas and they are doing very well. Sieta is doing very well, and I think they are bringing a lot of this Malaysian culture, Malaysian values overseas. I think in, I, was, I know that in the People's Republic of China, one of the greatest value of the foreign, uh, so the foreign uh, multinationals are looking for Malaysians and Singaporeans. Why? Because they feel that these are the people that are very trustworthy, you know, very loyal, they were not, they have got a certain sets of values that will work, that can, we, we have a set of values that can understand that, that is complementary to the multinationals, you know, they, they have the, almost the same values as them. So, uh, Malaysians are highly sought after to go overseas. We just need to be a little bit more ambitious and not to think that, uh, that uh, being here is the, our ultimate aim. In the context of, of uh, a, a, a unifying culture, Tan Sri, um, some might say that the GLC and the GLIC uh, internal culture might be artificial and, and uh, exist in its own sphere. For the family-owned companies, which of course is a very much an Asian phenomenon, something in the order of 65 to 70% of listed companies in Asia are family-owned. Is there a parallel culture? Is there a parallel lesson to be learned for family-owned companies that are not within the GLC definition when they go overseas? I, I think whether it's for the GLC or the family-based companies, uh, there is a lot of uh, common elements, common ingredients. Of uh, number one, I think as we go overseas, we got to understand our business. We got to have uh, we got to be very competitive and very efficient in the areas that we want to uh, in the businesses that we want to do overseas. Because if we are not competitive and efficient, then just going overseas is uh, useless. It's useless. And of course, we must have a group of people that we can bring along to, to bring our values, people that we can trust at least initially and to eventually to set up the operations there and to train the local people so that we have a 
truly a multinational uh, team working for us. And Tantri, within the um, successful family holding company um, culture, there is a um, bit of a Chinese curse, if you like. And curse is obviously a very strong word, but the first generation, the founder generation makes the money. The second generation has a bit of fun with the money and still knows how to run the business and feels the hunger. And the third generation is rather frivolous with the money. For in the context of having a succession plan, in the context of, of making a fist of it in the regional businesses, how do you handle the conundrum between family members and uh, imported talents? And how do you uh, groom these both sides uh, productively? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a common problem between the, uh, for all the families on a global basis worldwide. Yeah, the Americans, I remember, also have a saying like the Chinese, from short sleeve to short sleeve in three generations. You know, they have the, the same saying. And also in the uh, Western world, there are also a lot of family companies that have uh, uh, gone beyond these three generations and are very, very successful in maintaining this. I think generally we are much more conscious now that we have to go beyond the three generations for our family companies. We are much more conscious now, and therefore, I think we have got to start building uh, or tra training the people who are capable within the family. We got to put into them the right attitude. Attitude is very important because they have got to earn their keep within the organization. We got to be very conscious that there's no nepotism but meritocracy within the company. And if they cannot really run the company, they may, they may have to be taught to look for outside good management to run the company. Because I don't think we should expect, uh, it would be nice to have a natural successor from the company, but I think a lot of uh, company, a lot of uh, big conglomerates, family conglomerates, right, uh, like uh, Mr. Robert Kwok, I think that they've gone way beyond that, right? They've got a lot of professional management within it, but they practice meritocracy. In your experience, how um, do you infuse the hunger and the, the desire and the hard working, the culture of hard work in future gen generations who have enjoyed the trappings of success of the founder, the founder generation? Yeah, it's true, it's true. I think they we shouldn't spoil the future generation. But the fact remains that if we are successful, the future generations will, will have much more to enjoy anyway. So I think it's a balance to remind them, is to remind them that uh, of the basic values of decency, of being a human being, you know, attitude, you know, don't show off just to be a decent human being. I think that will bring a lot of values in them and that will transform itself into their, wherever they are as a, as a human being. And I guess in all, uh, across all, all cases, Tantri, uh, there are some leaders who are broad strokes leaders, there are some leaders who are macro leaders, and there are some leaders who are managers, who are micromanagers. Uh, where do you fall on this, on this needle, Tantri? I, I tend to fall somewhere in between, you know. Uh, I know a little bit of the macro picture, but yet I find that for our industry, at least, we need to be detailed because, as, uh, as you heard, if you don't walk, walk the fields, you don't talk to the trees, I think the trees are not going to produce. <laughs> and um, absolutely. And you, you talked about this in terms of, you know, when you make the very, very big decision of going abroad, uh, in terms of even ex expanding your land bank in, in the, within the country, you touched about how in the early days you were a bit conservative. You priced the price of land at that time on current uh, valuations, not what it could have been in the future, nece necessitating your, your response that it was a bit of a mistake in the early days. Um, what lessons can, can you know, businessmen of today uh, take from that, from that overly conservative view? Are you saying that we should be more aggressive going forward? Uh, yes, I, I think it's that... Um 
in the past, I think our non-aggressive, more conservative nature were also because that we were quite satisfied, you know, with what we already have. But as the world grows now, what you have, and if you don't grow it in a consistent manner, you also your you will also lose good management uh, talent within your company. And uh, as I was saying, is that opportunities doesn't come every day, or doesn't come very often in your life. But there are certain opportunities you know that are. Uh, that when it comes, you have to really grab hold of it. I think, of course, without endangering your company. Something you can afford, but something that you can uh, afford to look and just say, it's okay. it should be okay in five years' time, you know, because that is the direction in which I would like to go. I think this is the advice that I would like to give to the younger entrepreneurs, you know. Of course, the first thing is not to uh, think about buying something that you cannot afford to, but if there's something you can afford and without endangering the base of your company, uh, and when the opportunities come, I think you should give it a try. Aside from the staple considerations of valuation and, and price, Tanshri, what to you uh, amount to the hallmarks of, a, of, of, a, of a, an expansion that has to be done, come what may? For example, the expansion that you probably will have to do is that something that will bring you into a new field, a new type of business that is complementary to your business, a possible expansion into a new uh, region. For example, in our oleochemicals business, there's no way that we could have gone into some of the technologies that the multinational has. So when, when the opportunities came out, for example, in Switzerland, in, uh, in the area of uh, further downstream in the intoxilations of our, of our basic oleochemicals, we went along with it because there's no way we can develop that technology ourselves. Some companies and some entrepreneurs suffer from analysis paralysis, and this is very much a truism of, of management culture, but you have seen in the past as well that Continuous development is essential. Once you make a decision, other things happen, and other things happen and snowball as a result of that. Is, should that be a staple of entrepreneurialism, Tansri? Continuously doing things so that you're moving the envelope a little bit forward each time? Yeah, I, I would think it's definitely so. Because I think life is a, a journey, or when you venture into something, it's a journey. Without thinking the first major few steps, you will not know what are the steps ahead of you, you know. As you do one series, as you make some acquisition in something, uh, in one businesses, then you have a uh, new knowledge about that business, you have, uh, you meet other people, and it brings you new ideas. And yet in the context of doing that, Tanshri, and I'm going to cite the Crabtree and Evelyn case where you went into downstream and you went into retail, um, but it didn't have the desired effects. Now, whether for, for lack of a Malaysian culture, whether for lack of knowledge about retail, what lessons did you learn from that expansion? Okay. Uh, I think, first of all, I think that was a very good... Uh, Crabtree and Evelyn was a very good global brand, very well-recognized name. The main reason we went to the brand at that time, uh, foolishly in the sense that we were not prepared on the retail business, we doesn't know a lot of the retail business, uh, but the acquisition price was quite attractive because we were not paying a premium for the brands at that time. Uh, the lessons to be learned was that, as I said, we were from the plantation business. We do not know that the retail business is so fast changing, you know, so fast changing. It's also, uh, the retail business is also about properties. It's properties, because if you don't have, uh, if you do not innovate fast enough and to, and to increase your sales, the rise in rental will yield up your profits. I think secondly is that we do not have a team 
that we can bring from Malaysia to the, to the United States where we control the process better. There was, uh, uh, when we hire uh, so-called celebrity CEO, they, the tendency is that they will take risks with your money. Absolutely. So, <laughs> having talked about the importance of entering a, a complementary business, uh, Tan Sri Nen, having uh, talked about how the price at the time was quite attractively priced, uh, but also having gone through the curve, you know, flattening, if you like, how, at what point in the acquisition, in the, in the expansion strategy, do you say, okay, hang on team, it's, it's time to, to lick our wounds and, and, and play damage control? What are, the, what are the danger signs? I think that one of the danger signs is that you are spending too much time on the acquisition that is not giving you the returns that you would like and distracting yourself from the main of the core business. So this is, uh, this is one sign that you should perhaps exit the business and concentrate on rebuilding your core business as we are doing now. Is there a percentage that you can ascribe to the amount of time spent, you know, 20%, 25%, or is it very much a case-by-case -case basis? I think it's case-by-case case when you are spending a disproportionate, disproportionate time on the new acquisition and you do not see the potential of this new acquisition to be greater than what you have now. Well, I guess the other road bump facing the broad um, um, edible, well, palm oil industry is the fact that uh, sustainability seems to be very much uh, the order of the day, uh, industry-wide, and in the Malaysian context, RSPO, although good from a sustainability pers perspective, is hindering uh, the, the you know, Malaysian planters in, in mature markets like Europe and uh, North America. You know, in the context of KLK, w what is the uh, strategy uh, going forward? Yeah, I, I believe for the industry, the round table of sustainability of palm oil, this is the only organization in the world of any commodity crop where we have a group of producers, the uh, consumers, the industrialists like Unilever, the NGOs, and the host and other stakeholder like the local population uh, involved. This is the first time in the world that we have got such a group. And so far, I think we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, hiccups here and there. But in such a group, where we got so many stakeholders, I'm certain that no one is uh, hundred percent happy with what is happening. And in a way, it's a good. Thing thing because it's a give and take. But I think RSPO is a good thing for the industry um, because it allows us to be very much more conscious about the world uh, requirements for not just our industry, for the whole, for, the, for all the different uh, commodities. But what we do not like is that some of the NGOs that are inside this uh, RSPO where they subscribe to the same criteria and principles are now saying that this is not enough, you know. Outside, they are speaking a different message, you know. So, but I think it's important to the, in the, to the industry, the RSPO. One of the byproducts of the RSPO system is it, it has driven up production cost because all parts of the uh, value chain has to be addressed <clears throat> and done on sustainable uh, levels. But the thing is, on the buy side, the prices have not reflected uh, and, and the demand side have not reflected the additional costs. How much of a problem has that been for you know, yeah. planters such as yourselves? Well, of course, uh, as some, one of my colleagues in the industry have always mentioned, RSPO is like shuffling a deck of cards. To run a business, you must have the deck of cards. It's just organizing the cards in order. So I think it's a, our, 
the requirements of ISPO, of course, put a lot of constraint on us in terms of uh, expansion, in terms of uh, proper governance, in terms of uh, all those things. But I think this are, in a way, these are the cause of doing the business correctly. In limited cases, there have been premium paid for RSPO oil, you know. So I think is that sometimes you can get a good premium for, I wouldn't say a very good premium, a reasonable premium for RSPO oils, which does pay for your efforts.